Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I apologize, it's been a while since I posted my last video, but I've had a lot of crazy stuff going on and it's just taken up a lot of my time and I just didn't have enough time to do any new content. But I'm here for part two of moving to Seattle. So let's get back into it. But first I wanted to break things down a little bit and show you guys some numbers and what the cost of living in Seattle is really like and income levels and things like that so you guys don't think I'm making things up or not giving you guys enough details. I want to make sure that anyone who moves here is going to have a very, maybe not a 100% idea of what to expect, but a very, very good and clear um, expectation. So let's go. As you can see, in 2019, Seattle's household median income had reached $102,500, which is significantly higher than the rest of America. You can see what I'm pulling up here is the cost of living for Seattle. And yes, it's significantly higher than most of the smaller towns and cities in the country, but for major cities, it's really not that bad. You have to remember that these are average prices and costs for these items. There is a high range and a low range that's averaged together to get these median prices. Things are on sale all the time at the grocery stores here, and where you choose to buy groceries matter too. You can see there a pair of jeans is on average $52, but I bought really high quality expensive jeans for 20 bucks. So really it's how you shop and how patient you are and how diligent you are to get a good price rather than the city itself giving you a good price. I've been to many smaller cities and I've seen some of the prices there and it's not always cheaper than Seattle if you're not being careful with how you spend. I mean, when I went to St. Louis for a work trip, I was paying the same price for a cup of Starbucks coffee or iced tea there as I was paying here, but I for sure know that my income here is significantly higher than there. Now let's get to some juicy rent prices because living costs is a lot because of housing costs. As you can see, the median rent in Seattle right now is $14.95 a month for a one bedroom. That's a 17% reduction year over year since last year. And I know some of you guys are gonna still be astounded by this price, but you have to understand, like we said, the average income here is much higher. Obviously, $1,500 is not for a luxury high rise, but you can get a very nice studio in the city in a high rise. I was actually looking at my building just for fun and I saw that a lot of the studios around 450 to 500 square foot was around that much um, and they were really beautiful and very good layout. So as you can see the two to three bedroom ranges are significantly higher. It looks like they just double up by bedroom so if one bedroom is 1500 then two bedrooms 3000 and then four bedroom is so on. It's, I think the mindset is that people are going to have roommates when they're living in two or three bedrooms. So they're going to charge each person the same amount. Rather than giving you a discount, like in the past when you get a two bedroom, it's not exactly double. As you can see, the areas I'm scrolling through here are very close to downtown or completely adjacent to downtown. But not being in downtown or Capitol Hill brings down your prices significantly from 1500 to 1200 to 1000 to 1100 on average. Um, so you don't need to live in downtown. Public transportation here is more than enough to get you into downtown from the adjacent cities and areas. From this list, you can see that there are a lot of great areas, very close areas that are very affordable, like First Hill, Lower Queen Anne, Fremont. Those areas are very close to downtown and great areas to live in and the rent is significantly cheaper than what you would find in downtown or Sabbath Union or Cap Hill. What you're seeing on the screen are actual live uh, rentals that are available right now. Well, probably not right now because I made this video some weeks ago, but as you can see, the prices are not as bad as you think because you have to remember average price means there's above and below. So for those of you guys who are moving here, don't be psyched out by these average prices. There's still places for you that are cheaper if you're looking for a budget place. You can see here that this is the performance of all the major cities um, on the West Coast. Obviously, Seattle and San Francisco are the only two with increasing rental uh, markets right now. And I wanted to be fair and not biased by showing you another um, report of average prices. And Seattle, in this report, is about $1,800 average housing price. So as you can see, at the highest point and the lowest point, it's still fairly close and it's not completely crazy like everyone thinks. This report shows that Seattle's housing market only reduced 14% compared to last year, whereas my first report showed that Seattle reduced by 17%. So you, you can find that the average rent here will linger anywhere between 1500 to 1800 depending on who you talk to. But I guarantee you, there will always be very affordable spaces if you look for it and you accommodate your needs accordingly. 
As you can see in this report right here, a lot of the suburbs outside of Seattle cost just as much or even more. For instance, Bellevue or Linwood or Kirkland. A lot of you guys have asked me about those areas and I think they're great if you want a family atmosphere. Those areas are completely fine, but the commute into the city can be hectic once COVID lifts and traffic gets annoying again. As you can see here, we're in the middle of downtown. This is Westlake area, the Amazon headquarters area. Um, these are the Amazon office buildings and surrounding this area are a ton of nice high rises and newer apartment complexes. This is where you're going to ideally be looking at around $1,500-$1,600 a square foot for a townhouse. Um, these condos and apartments um, are very convenient though because they're right in the city. You can get anywhere within this zone um, on foot. We're now going into Lower Queen Anne, which is where I was telling you that rent is actually very affordable right now, and it's adjacent to uh, the center of downtown, and it's close to the Space Needle, has a lot of restaurants, and just a lot of conveniences and buses and public transportation, not to mention parks too. Um, so this is a very good area if you're on more of a budget but want to be in the middle of the city. You can see here that Queen, Lower Queen Anne used to be a bunch of old apartments, but they're starting to renovate, they're starting to build new stuff. Don't worry. The culture of this place is still the same. Where we're at now though, we're actually now in Upper Queen Anne, but you're gonna get more of a suburban feel. But the culture here is really nice because there's a lot of mom and pops restaurants and bars and just eateries around here and coffee shops. It's a really good place for families and young adults who want a quiet life but still have very close access to downtown. We're now driving through Inner Bay, which is the little weird connector section where Ballard, Queen Anne, Magnolia, and downtown kind of merge together. And this is where a lot of young professionals are living right now. It's becoming a place with more things to do. But you're going to have to kind of go out of this area to find entertainment and um, get the amenities that you get in the other areas. We're now driving across the Ballard Bridge to get to Ballard. If you guys remember Disney's movie Up, the home in that movie was inspired by a home here uh, owned by Edith Macefield who refused to give up her home to bigger construction companies. Basically, they paid her millions of dollars for her home so they can build up more high-rises, but she said no. She hated the fact that her neighborhood was being turned into a commercial center that's modern and is not what Ballard stands for. Builders were interested because Ballard is like a bubble in itself. It has everything you need all in one spot and it's very popular to most Seattleites living in the city. Though because of all this and the fact that it's very accessible to downtown, it's gotten fairly expensive here, um, both to rent and to buy. So if your budget makes sense and you want this this kind of lively atmosphere that's still a small town rather than a metropolitan area, then Ballard is the right spot for you. A lot of people like Ballard because it's a small town feel, although you're not really in a small town, and it has all the amenities like you can see here, there's tons of shops, tons of restaurants everywhere. It's very artsy, it's very much creative, and a lot of artists like this area, and they're known for their dive bars, their musical venues, and so it's definitely a place that I find describes Seattle the best, at least what the true DNA of Seattle is, especially before all of the Amazon and construction and the modernization that Seattle has experienced in the last five to 10 years. So we're driving up to one of my favorite beaches in Seattle and one of my favorite areas to spend my summers at. Um, it's called Golden Gardens. It's right in Ballard or adjacent to downtown Ballard and I think it's a really nice place to just spend the day. You can go fishing, crabbing, there's a lot of other things you can do. Just lay out in the sand and tan, play volleyball. Um, a lot of people like to go here um, and do kayaking also or paddleboarding. So it's a great area to go to, which is another plus side of living in Ballard. If you live south of downtown though, you would go to Alki Beach, which you can see in one of my other videos. Though, if you decide to live somewhere outside of Ballard, but still within that greater downtown Seattle area, you'll be able to get here in about 10-15 minutes depending on traffic, or at most 25-30 minutes with traffic. So north of this area right here is going to be an area called Crown Hill or Shoreline, which is really great too because it's very suburban, but it's still very accessible to downtown and a lot of these sort of parks and beaches and um, amenities if you're an outdoorsy person and can't always make it to the mountains um, and still want to be able to take walks or runs. Definitely stick to the areas along the coastline of Seattle. We're now driving up to Fremont, which is 
what I consider the baby sister of Ballard. It's very similar in culture, but it's just a little bit smaller and a little bit younger. More working professionals hang out here. There's more bars and clubs, and of course, a lot of companies that most of these adults work at. For instance, Google has a headquarter here, and so does Tableau, and so does Brooks Running Shoes. So as you can see, this is the perfect spot for people who are working both companies or even the ones downtown, because from Fremont to downtown is a quick drive around the lake because Fremont is right on the tip of the uh, north side of South Lake Union, whereas downtown and Amazon and Facebook are just on the south side of the lake, and the lake is not very big. I would say Fremont to downtown would be like a five minute drive without traffic, and a lot of people actually bike back and forth and don't even drive. It's also very close to the University of Washington, so a lot of students hang out here even. Um, we're driving under the I-5 bridge, which is the main arterial for the whole city. Um, and as you can see here, we see Brooks Running Shoes. Um, we see downtown Seattle, which is right across the lake. So it's, it's, it's very close and it's a very good spot for working professionals who um, want to save a little bit of money because Fremont rent is a little bit cheaper than downtown and a little bit cheaper than Ballard even. So um, if you look at my list in the beginning of the video, you'll see that Fremont is one of the places that has more affordable rent but has a lot of newer buildings and a lot of amenities. We're now up to a very, very popular part of Seattle too called Wallingford. A lot of University of Washington students also live here, a lot of working professionals, a lot of young families, and just everyone in general. It's a very convenient area because it's right on the edge of downtown. It's probably one or two exits from downtown on the highway. And it's actually very central because you can get downtown in about five minutes without traffic. You can get across Lake Washington and get to Bellevue and Redmond, which is where Microsoft and the future extended Amazon headquarters will be at in another like five to 10 minutes. So Wallingford has become very, very expensive, probably comparable to downtown or Capitol Hill in terms of price of rent and uh, living costs. What Wallingford has that downtown doesn't have though is a very homey and neighborhoody feeling. I would say it's pretty comparable to Capitol Hill in uh, the way that the culture is. Although one difference is that Capitol Hill has a party and club and really young vibe. Although Wallingford does have bars and hangouts like that, it's very different because it's actually more focused more towards older people, more working professionals that have been out of college for a while, or young people who are just starting families right now and just want a quiet life. Um, so that's the difference. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, college students live here too, so it gives a little bit more of that academia feel, almost like a college town, even though Wallingford's technically not the college town of Seattle, University District is, but because it's so adjacent and so many students live here, it gives that kind of vibe. Although one sad thing that's been happening to these neighborhoods is COVID has killed off a lot of longtime favorites and mom and pop places in these areas. So. Hopefully they'll be able to come back and uh, the culture doesn't get affected too much post pandemic. So we're driving up to a Seattle favorite and a local favorite, which is Dick's Burgers. It's one of the drive-ins that's been around here forever and it's just been the same since the beginning. It's actually just about lunchtime, so I'm gonna stop in and grab a bite and also be able to show you guys what Dick's Burgers is like. I'm pretty sure most of the shops have stayed exactly the same, they have not renovated it, and even some of the newer ones that built were built to look exactly the same as this, so they try to keep with their original core concept and their aesthetic and everything. How I would describe Dick's Burger is Dick's Burger to Washington is like in and out to California. Surprisingly, one of the things I like about them is their soggy fries. Usually I hate soggy fries, but for some reason the way that Dick's makes it, I don't mind it and I enjoy it. I guess Dick's to me has a lot of memories, a lot of late nights going out and they're still open. They're the only thing that's open and you stop by drunk with your friends and you grab food. Um, there's a lot of that nostalgia for most of the people who live here in Seattle or, you know, have visited and done the same thing. The weather in Seattle has been very temperamental lately. It was sunny this morning, now it's rainy and it looks like once the rain is done, then the sun's going to break out again for a sunset. Who knows? But we're now driving into U District. This is the University Avenue, which is the main strip of the area where all the students are at. Um, this is the Burke Museum. We're right at the beginning of campus. Um, it's one of the most beautiful campuses in America, or the world, I would say. It's really famous for its cherry blossoms. Um, a lot of tourists come here in March and April just to see it. But yeah, this is also my alma mater. And if you want to see the cherry blossom video, I actually do have one. So make sure to go to my channel and check it out from there. And if you like what you see, Go ahead and give me a subscribe. I will thank you forever for that. 
So we're driving down towards the uh, university village, which is where a lot of the newer apartments are at. A lot of working professionals actually have opted to live around this area too. The neighborhoods around the university are super ultra expensive, especially Windermere and Laurelhurst, but it's also very convenient to downtown and the campus is gorgeous as you can see. Um, a lot of people use the campus as a place to go running or work out because it's basically a giant park. So we're gonna cut right through campus to go to the next area where I think it's a really great hidden gem of Seattle where not many people think about when they think of where to live, um, especially people from out of town. That's one of the areas that they don't really look at. Most people in Seattle don't even know this area exists. To be honest, I didn't even find out about that area until sometime towards the end of college when I started exploring around for apartments more and then stumbling upon the area. Um, and I grew up in Seattle and I went to school in the University of Washington. So um, that tells you how hidden this place is. So we're now going out towards the south end of University of Washington campus and across the bridge. It's called the East Lake Bridge and we're going to go to East Lake. East Lake is a little strip of neighborhood that's right along the edge of South Lake Union um, between University District and downtown Seattle in an area called Mont Lake and Capitol Hill. Um, there's a lot of apartments here. There's a lot of townhomes and single family homes. Um, it's a very convenient area to live. You never really have to get on the highway to get anywhere because it's right in the center and there's a lot of access to all the neighborhoods we've been talking about. Um, and the thing is, it's really rare to have any type of traffic to get from East Lake to any of those neighborhoods, even downtown. So it's very convenient in that sense. Um, the reason why it's not so popular is because it doesn't have a lot of uh, amenities like grocery stores or restaurants and things like that, but it's starting to grow. As you can see here, there's more and more new apartments going up, more new housing, and with that comes a lot more space for retail and restaurant space. Though, because it's the crack right between Cap Hill, U District, Fremont, Wallingford, and downtown, you can double dip into all those areas and take advantage of all the amenities there without a need for having them in Eastlake at all. So if you're moving to Seattle and you want a good place to live that's convenient and also has good public transportation and very low traffic to get to and from everywhere, Eastlake is the place to go. As you can see, Eastlake is very close to downtown. We are pretty much in prime Amazon territory. And to the right of me a little bit more is where Facebook territory is at and the new Apple headquarters is going to be right around here also. So we're right back in downtown. We just made a big giant loop around the city on this trip. And to the left of me is where Capitol Hill is. Before we go there, let's take a little stroll through downtown again. This is more towards the east side of downtown, whereas this morning we were on the west side of downtown more. This area is called South Lake Union and it's growing rapidly. It used to be a bunch of warehouses and just rundown buildings, but now with Amazon coming in and the headquarters going pretty much all over South Lake Union and all the other tech headquarters moving from the Bay Area here, um, this area has just blown up with construction. There are a lot of beautiful new high rises here and a lot of nice apartments, but you're gonna pay a premium. Now we're going through the downtown core, um, Westlake Center, which is where all the shopping district is at and where all the tourists come to um, before COVID, you know, obviously was going on. The uh, Washington Convention Center is right here. Seattle's actually building a really big convention center just a little bit north of here. So we're gonna get a lot more tourists once that's done. And just right across the highway, we have Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill is the premier neighborhood now for young adults and a lot of working professionals just because it has a lot of amenities and entertainment and things to do, um, bars, club scenes, and um, unique clothing shops and things like that. Obviously, it's looking a little dead and slow right now because of COVID and a lot of businesses are kind of just not back operating yet and people are just not out. People in Seattle take COVID pretty seriously. The social distancing, the mask wearing and everything is taken very seriously here. So you're not going to see people everywhere all over the place jam-packed like sardines right now. So remember I was saying how Ballard and Wallingford is very similar to Capitol Hill? But Capitol Hill is just Ballard and Wallingford on speed just because there's been so much growth in Capitol Hill that it's just blown up with new construction and crazy amount of people just all of a sudden coming into this area and living here. It's gotten very dense, not to mention way more expensive. I remember when I had just gotten out of college, I rented a one bedroom apartment here and it was $950 for over a thousand square foot. That same apartment now is running for almost $2,000 and it's not a new apartment. 
So Capitol Hill originally was known as the kind of gay capital, LGBTQ capital of the state, um, similar to how the Castro is for San Francisco. But over time, it's kind of lost that a little bit. And that's the biggest uh, concern with folks that are um, in Seattle right now is that that kind of culture, that kind of identity of the area is being lost. It'll be interesting to see what this area kind of turns out to be in the next five, 10 years with the expansion of Seattle on a whole and this neighborhood in particular. A good area of Seattle to also live in is Central District or um, First Hill. Uh, there's a lot of apartments, a lot of options. It's very neighborhoody. It's still very close to everything. Um, and you have access to Madison Valley and um, Capitol Hill still. So it's also a very convenient place to live. It's crazy for me to see how much Central District has grown because I remember back in college, it was still pretty small and a lot of mom and pop's place and very multicultural. And it was actually considered one of the more affordable places to live in Seattle. A little history lesson on Seattle, back in segregation days and before that, Seattle had laws that kind of segregated where certain races could live. And Central District and this whole area was designated for black people. Um, so it's kind of interesting how now it's gentrified quite a bit and it's kind of pushed a lot of these families out. Another area where a lot of young working professionals and young adults are starting to move into now and causing to be gentrified is the Rainier, Mount Baker, and Columbia City area, which we're now driving through. As you can see, there's a lot of new construction, the light rail's up and running, so it's bringing a lot of working professionals in here because the housing prices are much more affordable, um, but it still has the amenities, and a lot of people like the culture that is inherently in these areas. Historically, these areas were primarily Asian, um, African American, Latino, and just multicultural. But over time, the white population is starting to increase quite a bit um, due to the gentrification of this area. And so we're seeing a big change in the dynamic of the, the area. So it'll be really interesting to see how Seattle balances, you know, housing costs with, you know, culture and equality in terms of uh, living areas in the city. So you guys, please take a look at what's happening. It's sunny and it's hailing at the same time. Seattle actually doesn't hail very often, but this year has been super chaotic. And one block and two minutes later, it's super sunny. And we are now in Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill is getting super duper expensive. And actually, it's one of the areas that are being developed like crazy right now. It's on the south side of downtown and it's just a hop and a skip across a small, very, very small bridge to downtown. Um, this area has a lot of culture. It used to be predominantly Asian. Um, again, it's turning very uh, gentrified and more working professionals and young families are also moving to this area now. Um, just because it's it's very convenient and the area is actually very cozy and it's very neighborhoody and the home prices have just skyrocketed. Beacon Hill is getting really popular because of its location and the fact that it still has amazing views of Lake Washington and downtown and Elliott Bay, but still very close to the city and still somewhat more affordable than Capitol Hill. So once people were getting pushed out of Cap Hill and uh, Central District, they were starting to come down to Beacon Hill now. Beacon Hill is one of those areas where there is a little bit of a um, presence of you know, restaurants and stores and things like that, but it's still very, very small and it's growing. Um, so if you're looking for somewhere with a lot of bars and clubs, you're not gonna find it here. But it's so close to Capitol Hill and it's so close to downtown and Pioneer Square and International District and Columbia City, you're not gonna have a problem finding amenities. Please, please note that it's now raining again. It's been probably like three minutes since it was bright and sunny, but I don't know what's going on in Seattle today, but it's been really random and all over the place. So uh, I don't know. Anyway, back on track. Beacon Hill actually is much more affordable than downtown or Capitol Hill. Um, there's a lot of variety in quality and price points of apartments. You can still find those really bougie, nice ones with ocean view, downtown view, and pay a little bit more or you can find the more affordable apartments that are a little bit older, but still quaint and still charming. Um, there's a lot of variety in Beacon Hill. There's also a lot of townhomes, uh, newer townhomes that uh, people have rented out. So if you're looking for more space and you don't want to be in a high rise or an apartment, then Beacon Hill is one of the better areas to look for townhomes or single family homes to rent and still be in the city. 
Beacon Hill is also one of those areas where if you don't drive, you will be fine. There's buses and light rail that goes to all areas of the greater Seattle area and pretty soon to Bellevue also in Redmond. So if you work on the east side and live over in downtown, that's fine too. As you can see here, we're going right down to downtown from Beacon Hill. And once we cross this bridge, we're gonna be right at International District and Pioneer Square in downtown. An area that most people don't think about is International District. A lot of people have this idea that when you live in International District, it's kind of ghetto, it's kind of scary, it's kind of dangerous, but it's actually not. I lived there. It was actually really fun. Um, it was really lively and obviously before COVID, there was a lot of food festivals. There's just a lot of stuff going on around there. You can always find food because the Asian uh, restaurants open really late. We used to go out and eat at four in the morning at Chinese restaurants around here and it'd be packed because everyone would get out of the bars in the club and just go straight to International District. So we've made a loop around the city again and we're now right around First Hill, which is also another great area to live because it's right on the edge of downtown and Capitol Hill. So it's very convenient for those of you who work in downtown or um, work in the tech sector. First Hill is where Seattle University is. So it's kind of a little bit of a college town, a very small private university, but still gives a little bit more of that academia feel to it. Um, but if you look straight down at this street, it actually goes right downtown to the water also. So um, it's very convenient for those who work downtown. A lot of the government buildings are down there. So if your new job is uh, for the government, this would be perfect for you. As you can see, all these brand new apartments and retail spaces have just gone up within the last three to five years, maybe less than five years, but um, it's growing quite a bit. This used to be a low income housing neighborhood and they've moved that a little bit more south and they've taken over the space to create more um, living space for the influx of people moving to the city for the expanse of work um, at all the tech companies. All right, so like I said, First Hill connects to Capitol Hill. So we're right back at Capitol Hill now. And so Capitol Hill is the premier neighborhood in Seattle for young adults. But I feel that if you're someone who doesn't like being in the midst of a lot of action and just to be in the middle of where all the bars and clubs and stuff are, then Capitol Hill might not be the right place for you because it will get loud. Once COVID's over and bars and clubs open up again, it gets pretty loud and rowdy at night. So I know I try to cram a lot into this video and it's getting really long, so I'm gonna stop right here. I know you guys have requested me for other content um, for other areas, suburbs of Seattle. I will do that in upcoming videos, but for now, um, make sure to share, like, and subscribe so you see when those videos are posted up next. Again, thank you for checking out my content, and for those of you who have subscribed to me and continue to support me, I really appreciate it. Um, I hope to see you guys very soon um, with new content. Until then, take care and goodbye! Thank you.